16. Uh, Mark chapter uh, 3, verses 1 through 6. And we uh, learned this morning in our study uh, that the Pharisees were watching Jesus. They were watching Jesus, and the text uh, clearly states uh, that they were uh, watching uh, Jesus for a purpose, and their purpose was to find something that they could accuse, some, something he's doing, that they can accuse him of violating the law and discredit him. They were looking for something wrong. And that's what I'm talking about when I say preserve the, the unity. There, You can look for wrong. But the, the core value says that I will look for good in all things, then use it for God's purpose in my life. But these Pharisees were looking for something uh, to accuse Jesus of, uh, discredit him, and he knew that they were looking at him. And the interesting thing about the Pharisees is that after Jesus heals the man, they did not do anything to support this man. They did not offer him a job. They did not thank God for his healing. They did not tell anybody else who was in the in need of that same healing that they were eyewitnesses of the power of God. They didn't do any of that. They went out and they formed a plan with another group of people, the Herodians. Uh, they plotted with the Herodians against Jesus, that they might destroy him. And notice how it escalates. They're watching him to accuse him. And then the watching him to accuse him moves to, we're going to plan to destroy him. And that, and, and, and that is a lesson. That's something we ought to remember about the Pharisees. And we must mark it down and pray to God for his spirit and never allow that kind of thing to happen in our lives. And so Jesus shows the Pharisees and all who were present that God cares for individuals. This man was withered. He had a withered hand. He had a hand he could not use. It was of no use to him. And Jesus healed the man's hand. And before he heals the man's hand, he asks a question to the Pharisees. The Pharisees were asked by Jesus, uh, is, it, uh, is it lawful on the Sabbath day to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill. And uh, they offered no explanation. They said nothing. So Jesus proceeds to heal the man. And in him healing the man, he teaches us three things. The uh, two things we pointed out this morning. Uh, and uh, uh, the first Verses number one and two, that our eyes are open. He wants our eyes to be open. Our eyes are open when we embrace the character and nature of God. When we embrace the character and nature of God, we will then embrace. We will then fulfill the purpose of God. The character and nature of God is that he cares. He cares for people. Uh, it doesn't matter what our economic status, doesn't matter what our physical condition is, it does not matter how much material things we've attained or accumulated, it does not matter how many accolades, achievements uh, we are recognized for on this side of life, it doesn't matter. We can be up, we can be down, we can be rich, we can be poor, we can be educated, uneducated, doesn't matter. We could be a criminal or a non-criminal, doesn't matter. Uh, we could be uh, of a different nationality than those who are introducing us to God, doesn't matter. He cares. His, he's, he's, 
His business is people. And church, when we make people our business in the church, then we are patterning ourselves after the character and the nature of God. Every meeting that we have, every uh, program we plan, uh, whatever we're doing, brothers, whenever we get together to discuss the finances of the church or the, the building, or whatever pertains to the church, the people should be in mind. We should never place physical things and physical attainments over the people. That's the character and the nature of God. And if we make that our character and our nature, we love people. If we do that, then God will always bless our efforts uh, in serving him and glorifying him and worshiping him. Even with our youth day coming up, it's all about people. Whoever comes on the church grounds, our objective is to serve them and to let them know that they are loved by God. Whatever discussions that we need to have, whatever differences we need to sell, whatever uh, needs to be worked out, we get in a room or we get in a place and we do it among ourselves. But when we are out serving, it's all about the people. And we've got to practice that, uh, not, only for, not only for the growth of the church, but so that we can have favor with God. And if we have favor with God, then God is going to bless us with whatever growth he sees he see, he see fit to bless us with. And then, and then uh, the second thing we looked at in Mark chapter 3, verses 3 through 4, is uh, that, that when we take inventory, when we take inventory of our life, the most important question is, do I have a better chance of living with my needs supplied, my, a peace in my heart, surrounded by unconditional love, the hope of eternal life with God? Do I have a better chance of having all of that with Jesus or without Jesus? And I want to answer, I know that we're not uh, uh, verbalizing on Zoom, but I want to answer that we have no chance of having our needs supplied, peace in our heart, surrounded by unconditional love, and having the hope of eternal life with God without Jesus. We have no chance at all. There's nothing that you can accumulate that will give you those things. Man, I, I, I was looking at uh, a, 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 a picture of a Mercedes-Benz Maybach and uh, the, uh, the, the back seats in the car recline. And you have so many luxuries and amenities in that car. But you know, a Mercedes-Benz is nice and as luxurious and as technologically advanced as that car is. That car cannot give me peace in my heart. That car cannot surround me with unconditional love. In fact, if I drove up on the church ground in a Mercedes Benz Maybach, that might separate me from my brothers and sisters. The hope of eternal life with God, that car can't do that for me. Only Jesus can do it. Only Jesus can do it. You can, uh, you can uh, uh, become a part of an organization, a sorority, uh, a, a community service or community group, and all of those things are good and necessary. But they cannot take the place of your relationship with God in Jesus Christ. I had a brother come uh, by one day and he asked me about being a Mason. Brother Frazier, what uh, do you think about being a Mason? Masons read the Bible. I said, uh, being a Mason cannot take the place of Jesus. You, your sins cannot be cleansed through being a Mason. Your sins cannot be cleansed through being anything uh, such as a sorority or organization or community service or a public group. Those 
things cannot cleanse you of your sins. The only person that can cleanse you of your sins is Jesus Christ. It's Jesus Christ. Do we need uh, uh, societal things? Yes, we do. But always remember, as a Christian, none of those things can take the place of Jesus. Your life cannot be better without Jesus. But third, third, the third thing that we're going to look at this evening is Mark chapter 3 and verse number 6. The Bible says, Then the Pharisees went out and immediately plotted with the Herodians against him how they might destroy him. The Pharisees left the presence of Jesus. They left the presence of Jesus to plot to destroy Jesus. They didn't leave the presence of Jesus because of how he affected a person who did not have God. They uh, did not leave the presence of Jesus because of uh, them being satisfied with what took place in the life of this man with the withered hand. No, they left the presence of Jesus dissatisfied, upset. They had a mobbish attitude. And they were claiming to be children of God. They were upset with Jesus. They witnessed Jesus. They witnessed Jesus heal this man. And they left the presence and that assembly upset. I want to ask us a question. Have we ever left church upset? Nobody, nobody did anything to you. Nobody did anything against you. Nothing was done unscriptural, but you left upset. Have you ever known somebody to leave the worship service, leave the assembly upset? Nobody did anything to them. Nobody said anything to them. Nobody did anything unscriptural, <clears throat> but they were upset. These Pharisees, left upset. They were so upset that they went to the Herodians. They didn't keep this to themselves. They got some folk to join in with them. They got with the Herodians to plot against Jesus. Now, whenever a person destroys the opportunity for a person, another person to see God, experiences grace, experiences love and his mercy. And yet they claim to be a child of God. That person cannot see. Open your eyes and see. You cannot see. The, the Pharisees left the presence of Jesus. They enlisted the Herodians to plot against Jesus to destroy Jesus. What did Jesus do? He had changed the life of this man with the withered hand. He had given this man a new lease on life. This man has a blessing beyond an explanation. Extraordinary. And instead of the Pharisees encouraging the Herodians to embrace Jesus, they enlisted them to plot against Jesus, to destroy Jesus, to try to keep Jesus from doing these kinds of great works in the lives of people. So in order for us to not be like these people, to be people who can see, we must consider what's most important to a person who loves God. See, when, when, when we are people who love God, three things will be most important to us. I'm asking, do we love God? But I, if you love God, then three things will be most important to you. And you see these three things in the text. One, 
you'll love whom God loves and use his will to show such love. You'll love whom God loves and you will use his will to show that love. See, Jesus loved the man with the withered hand. See, the withered hand did not change Jesus's love for him. Whether the man, the man had an impairment. Now, the text does not say, you know, what caused the impairment. We don't know if the impairment was a birth defect. We don't know if the impairment is because of an injury. We don't know if the, the, the impairment is a, a result of a, another type of illness that he had. We don't know what the, wither, the, the reason why the man had the withered hand. We don't know. All we know is that Jesus saw the man with the withered hand. He saw the man with the problem. He saw the man with the need for a better life. And he had the power to give that man a better life. And he understood that I want everybody. I came that you might have life. I want everybody, every part of my creation, every member of my creation to have the love and the power that I have. And when we love God, We'll love like that too. Now I'm going to say this. Is it easy? No, it's not. It's no, it's not. Because we've got our emotions, passions, and appetites. They're tainted with sin. And that's why we've got to pray daily. Lord, I want to be like you. Lord, help me to walk like you walk. First John 2 and verse 6. We ought to walk just like he walked. And that's that we've got to ask God, Lord, help me to walk the way you walk. So we must love whom God loves and use his will to show such love. I'm going to show love not because this man deserves it. I'm, I'm going to show love not because of what he means to me. He did this. He did. See, we'll, we'll, we'll do, uh, We'll do things for other people because they did it for us. So you you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. You know, that's what some individuals call egotism. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. Then another term is called altruism. Altruism says I'll scratch your back, whether you scratch mine or not. Now, what causes me to scratch a person's back, whether they scratch mine or not? The will of God. I'm just being like my father. How can I forgive someone who didn't ask me for forgiveness? I'm being like my father. But that's where my just doesn't make any sense for me to do for you and you won't do for me. Yeah, when you're functioning off of your own will. But when you're being like your father, it makes perfect sense. It makes perfect sense. Okay, second thing is that we allow all of God's efforts to be the true motivation to allow him to work in our lives. To know that God is working on our behalf is a true motivation. See, God, God's efforts uh, to work on our behalf, Romans 8, 28, and we know all things work together for good to them that love God and who are the called according to his purpose. Like I, I know God works things out for my good. And I'm glad. But now, does God working things out for my good motivate me to allow him to work in my life? It's kind of like, you know, you know, we were we were talking, we were talking to the young people this morning. You know, you here, here your parents, your parents is doing for you, they're giving for you, and you sitting down watching TV. So your parents, uh, the, the, your parents are saying, "Hey, out of all the stuff that I do for you, you ought to take the initiative to get up and do something around this house." So 
so are the, do the kids say thank you when when the parents do for them? Uh, parents fix dinner. Thank you, mom and dad, for dinner. Sit down and watch TV. Uh, buy them some new clothes. Hey, I got some new tennis shoes. Thank you, mom and daddy. Play the game. You know, it's no, it's no just taking the initiative to do something around the house. It's just thank you, and then you go on and do what you do. That's what I'm talking about here. All of God's efforts to be, all of God's efforts to work on our behalf is to be the true motivation to allow him to work in our life. Because God works things out for my good, I'm going to worship. I'm going to serve. See, what he does for me is my motivation to worship him and to serve him. So, so, so to know that God works on our behalf is both a comfort and a joy. When you, when you sit back and you think about it, how he works things out for our good. I want you to just think, you, you, you do this you know, in, your, in your own spare time. I want you to think about the instances where you heard someone talk about how something didn't work out for them. And you went to that same situation, but it worked out for you. And you're a Christian. God works things out for our good. That uh, that is a comfort and a joy. If you if you if you want to get a picture of God working behind the scenes, just go over to Hezekiah. Hezekiah is just one. Isaiah thirty six. Isaiah goes to Hezekiah. Hezekiah says, Hezekiah, get, get your house in order. Lord says, get your house in order. You're gonna die, not dead. Hezekiah, he turns his face to the wall and start praying. Isaiah leaves out and he's praying, God, you know, I've been, you know, I've been faithful. You know, I've been good. And, and Hezekiah is praying. He don't see Isaiah. He doesn't see where Isaiah is walking. Isaiah is out the room. But then the text tells us that God stopped Isaiah. When he was leaving, he said, go back, Isaiah. See, now we're reading, when you read Isaiah chapter 38, you're reading what God is working out while Hezekiah is praying. Next thing you know, Isaiah is back to Hezekiah. Hezekiah's been praying, didn't see Isaiah leave, didn't hear the conversation that God had with Isaiah. All he knows is Isaiah's back. The same Isaiah that said, get your house in order. You're going to die and not live. Isaiah says, the Lord heard you cry. He heard you. And he says, he's going to give you 15 more years. Man, I tell you, Hezekiah experienced God working things out for his good. And then, and then Hezekiah knows he's going to get 15 more years. Then Isaiah tells the servants, what to get. I'm going to tell you the ingredients that you're going to use to put on the book. Isaiah, how do you know that? That's God working. It's God working. God's giving me that. So we can't always see where God is working. We can't see God working in a person's mind. We can't see God's uh, uh, God working in another room or across town or in another state in another city. But we can see the evidence of it. And when we see that evidence, it should become a motivation. You know what? I'm going to keep on worshiping. I'm going to keep on serving God because I know that God is working things out for my good. I, instead of me plotting against him, Oh, no, I'm going to allow him to work in my life. And then third and finally, never destroy another person's opportunity to come to God. Never destroy an opportunity, another person's opportunity to come to God. Take every opportunity 
to let that to let a person see as much of Jesus as you can show. Never destroy. That's what the Pharisees plotted to do. They plotted. They enlisted the Herodians in to the plot to keep people from the saving grace. Now we know, we know they they wasn't we, we know they were not going to see succeed. We know that they did not succeed. But just imagine, they say that they're children of God, but they're trying to keep people from seeing the very God they claim to serve. But if you love God, you won't keep people from God because you know that he loves people. John chapter 3. In verse 16, the Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. The world has not been destroyed as of yet. 448, May 29th, 2020, the world is still here. God is still loving us, hadn't condemned us. He's given us every opportunity to be saved. And we should take advantage of it. We should love him for it. We should allow him to work in our lives. If you're here this evening and you love God, but these three things are not strong in your life. Won't you say this evening, Lord, I'm sorry. Thank you for giving me the time you've given me in my life. Even when I was wrong, thank you for bringing me to this point of understanding. And Father, I need you to help me to be better. Give me more of your spirit. Give me more time and more opportunity. I know the way is not going to be easy. But I know that you are able to work things out for my good. Won't you say that to the Lord on today? I'm not trying to put words in your mouth. I'm just trying to stir you up, help you to see how you need to go to God, how I need to go to God, how we all need to go to God and ask him to help us. We need him. We can't make it without him. Rededicate your life to Jesus by repentance, confession, and prayer. If you're not a Christian, believe Jesus died for your sins. He was buried. He rose again the third day. The bloody shed at Calvary purchased the church of God, the church of Christ. Acts 20, verse 28, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, Mark 16, 15, and 16. Repent. Make up in your mind that God is right about everything. Acts 2 and verse 38. Confess Jesus to be the Christ, the Son of the living God. Acts 8, 37. We'll baptize you for the remission of your sins. According to Acts 2 and verse 38, the Lord will add you to his church. Acts 2 and verse 47, he will add you to the church of Christ. Romans 16 and verse number 16. Be that anyone's desire, we beg you to acknowledge yourself by chat, text, or verbally after we sing a verse of a song. I heard an old, old story, how a Catholic Savior came from glory. How he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning of his precious blood's atoning. Then I repented of my sins and won the victory.